I wish I'd known that not being good on the LSAT straight out of the gate has absolutely no bearing on where you can end up. Mindset is everything. I'm really excited to host this tonight. We're going to be talking about making Columbia Law School a reality and not just a dream, um, which actually Lisa and I have that in common. So I'm really excited to have this conversation with her. She's a former student and she'll be attending Columbia Law School this year. So should we do this, Lisa? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Doreen. Hopefully you know that. And if you don't, welcome. Um, I found before you take the LSAT because I wanted more resources myself for figuring out the steps along your career path in law. And today we will be speaking to Lisa, who is a former student of mine. She did LSAT tutoring with me and she is now about to attend. She's an incoming 1L at Columbia Law School. Some interesting facts about her path. She's a first generation college student, a first generation American. English was her second language. Those are some things we'll talk about as well. She served as a Fulbright in Taiwan. She speaks Mandarin Chinese as well as Spanish. She received her BA in political science and international relations from Wellesley College, where she focused primarily on counter insurgency tactics and US military strategy during the Iraq war. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Uh, Lisa and I actually became friends since uh, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. We became friends since we stopped tutoring. I, I've actually learned a lot about her just because I like to keep somewhat of a formal relationship with my students. And it's been such a blessing and I'm really excited for her journey and I'm excited to share it with all of you. Lisa, anything you want to say about your background that I didn't mention? No, I think you you got everything. It's pretty national security focused in undergrad and a little bit post undergrad. And now it's pretty legally focused. So I'm excited to, to have this conversation as well. Yay. Okay, awesome. So you posted like a few days ago about the fact that you are starting at Columbia. And one thing you mentioned is that your grandma was born on a U.S. owned banana plantation in Guatemala. And that part of your drive and what motivates you is recognizing how many First of all, that I think there are elements of luck, but obviously you worked really hard too, but there are elements of luck that we're able to do certain things because of the position that we're in, right? Like sometimes yes. maybe your grandma would have wanted to pursue that and just never had the opportunities. And you talk about how you don't believe that necessarily, I, actually, I'll just let you explain it. What are your views on hard work and the roles of hard work and luck for getting you to where you are now? Sure. That's a really great question and a topic I'm very passionate about because I think yeah. as Americans, we're often sold on this idea that if you work hard, you can do anything you want to do and you can be successful. And I won't deny that working hard can get you incredibly far. I mean, I think my story is an indication of that, but I also don't want to have that hubris to say that anyone can work so hard and be successful. And if they're not, then that means that they just didn't work hard enough. I think to me, that lacks an element of self-awareness and perhaps global awareness that it doesn't sit right with me. I did work incredibly hard. I think anybody who knows me knows that my work ethic is something that I take a lot of pride in. And I work, I have the privilege to work on things that I'm very passionate about and that I care about. And so, yes, I work hard, but it's also working hard for something that I am interested in and that will eventually benefit me and others in my community in ways that I am passionate about and ways that I think I care about very deeply. But at the same time, I also recognize that a lot of folks don't have that privilege. I remember sitting in one of my first year courses at Wellesley and a professor emphasized you all have the privilege of choosing to sit in this class, of choosing to attend the school. And I really do think that that's something that for me is very important to keep in mind, especially as I move forward in a career that is very privileged and that very few people have access to and that in a way functions to be somewhat exclusionary. I would say quite a bit exclusionary, actually, not only in the way that we express ourselves, but also in who has access to the justice system. Etc. So that that's my take, my hot take on that. Perhaps we could say. <laughs> um, also, another thing is we have this in common that we're both first generation college students, first generation Americans, and English second language. And you told me right before the call, actually, uh, before the interview, that 
you don't necessarily see it as a weakness or something to overcome. You think of it a little differently. And I think that that's a really useful perspective. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. I think that's actually one of my strengths. The fact that English isn't my first language, the fact that I had to be a little bit more resourceful in my academic journey from a very early age. I didn't have parents who could sit down and explain things that I didn't get in class. And if I didn't get it in class and I had to figure out how I would understand it later on. And that's not because they didn't want to help me or they didn't want to take the time. It's just that they didn't have the resources to contribute to my education in that way. And so I actually think that it developed a very strong work ethic from a very early age. I learned how to be resourceful, how to ask questions, and how to be present in all of my academic endeavors really early on at a time where I think a lot of folks get to rely on their parents to provide that kind of academic push forward. And so that, to me, is a strength that a lot of folks have, a lot of first generation, a lot of immigrant folks just grow up having to be a little bit more resourceful and being perhaps more creative, I think, is the word that I would use yeah. in, in getting the resources that they need. And English as a second language, well, I actually read an article in the New York Times a little while ago that showed that when you give kids, for example, if you have, I'll give you the the, re- the example of the researcher use, but if you place kids in front of a group of blocks and half the blocks are visible to the person sitting in front of them and half are not. The bilingual kids when asked, hand me the blue block, will hand the person in front of them the blue block that they have visible versus the one that only they can see. Whereas kids who only speak one language have a harder time and are a little bit more confused by the fact that they're looking at two blue blocks and they have no clue who which one the person in front of them wants. And so that ability to place yourself in somebody else's shoes and to consider things from others' points of view I think is incredibly helpful, especially as you get older and you navigate life, but also as a law student, it's the ability to consider something from multiple perspectives that is what's going to help you build a good case or be a good advocate. I mean, I definitely agree. And I want to share just because I feel like I think it's helpful to hear different perspectives sometimes, just like you're mentioning. But I think I had a similar perspective in terms of I recognize that it's useful to be able to think, see things from different perspectives and also Um, being resourceful. I definitely had to be that as well because my family didn't know a lot about the system, like the educational system here. Although they took some classes, but still like it wasn't the same. And I think another thing that I'm hearing like on a broader scale is just your outlook on things. Like so many people think of it as a negative, but you didn't think of it like that. You were like, no, it's not a negative. This is actually a positive. Because I think sometimes a lot of it is how you view it. If you view it as a negative, it kind of just becomes it because you see all of the negatives. And if you view it as a positive or a challenge, at least, right, then you just look at it as something that you're just going to work towards or overcome at least. So I think that's the broader message that I'm getting from what you're saying is to not, is like a lot of the, a lot of times it's just how you see it. Absolutely. And that kind of goes to the broader conversation concerning mindset, which I think is so important when we're talking (laughs) about all of this applying to law school that also it's mindset is such a big component of of it so as we're talking about mindset and also more generally one thing i'm curious to hear about is you've talked about how you knew that you wanted to go to columbia law but you had no idea how you were going to get there like you weren't sure how you could turn your dream into a reality and that's kind of the overarching theme of this conversation so i'd be curious to hear how did you go from it being your dream to making it into your reality i'll use another visual example I live right outside of DC and there is a really huge metro escalator in the station closest to my house. And every time I have to climb that stair or that escalator, I just think about how much further I have to go. And if I look up, I get so discouraged. But if I kind of keep my head down and put one foot in front of the other, I find that it becomes a lot easier. And before I know it, I'm at the top. And that's the approach that I use for everything in life. I don't really think about the end goal. For me, it's more about putting one foot in front of the other. And then it becomes about the process. And if it's about the process, then the end goal kind of takes care of itself. And for me, it was a very methodical a uh, very well researched approach that I took to applying to law school and even deciding to apply. Tell us, tell us about it. I want to hear about the methodical approach. So I went into undergrad with a very open mind. I knew that I wanted to major in political science and international relations, but I had no idea what kind of graduate degree I wanted to pursue. So I was not one of those people who went in 
and took pre-law courses and did legal internships, I had always heard from family and friends that I should pursue a law degree. And I think probably because I've always been a little bit of a contrarian, I wasn't too keen on it because of that. And I did do a legal internship my senior year in, in college, but there was never a really well fleshed out why. And I knew that if I was going to pursue a graduate degree, then I wanted to be very clear on why that degree and what purpose that would serve me and my career writ large. And so when I was an undergrad, I took a PhD course. I actually thought I was going to pursue a PhD in political science or a master's or something like that. And I realized very quickly that I did not have, at that point, I was a junior in college, I believe. I didn't have the skill set that I wanted to have to be comfortable performing at that level and to be able to conduct that kind of rigorous analysis that my professor was asking of me. And so I ended up taking the time between undergrad and I suppose now to really decide, okay, what do I want to do and what skill set do I need to develop in order to do that? And so for me, it was more so a an approach of let's see what skill set I can develop and which skill set I actually enjoy employing. And based off of that, then I'll decide which graduate degree I want to pursue. And so how did you think about the skill set that you wanted to, to pursue and, and develop? So I will also preface this by saying that I think so much of my path has shaped up the way it has because I was really open to having experiences that maybe didn't seem directly related to what my end goal was, but that actually ended up honing in and sharpening what I wanted to pursue. So the first was I did a Fulbright in Taiwan right after graduation and I was teaching, which was a completely different profession than the one that I thought I would be pursuing after graduation. And that time really broadened my horizons, not only in terms of the perspectives I gained and and the conversations that I had with my friends in Taiwan and my colleagues there, um, but also with regards to just having more time to sit and think about what I wanted to do next. And during my time in Taiwan, I started thinking a little bit about law school again. I'm not really sure how it came up, but I ended up buying some LSAT books and, you know, just not opening them, but I had them. And so I, again, still didn't have that why, but being in Taiwan, I was exposed to a lot of international security perspectives that I didn't have in college. And so that led me to pursue a national security fellowship in DC right after I got back from my Fulbright. And that was a Scoville Peace Fellowship, which brings folks to DC for about six to nine months every year and allows you to pursue an interest of yours. And for me, that was working on nuclear issues at a defense think tank. And so my time there was actually what determined or which made me decide that I wanted to pursue a legal career. And it's interesting because I didn't have a background in nuclear security. I had focused on counterinsurgency and military strategy during my undergrad. And so just being willing to take that step and step into a role that I wasn't necessarily incredibly comfortable with was what ended up giving me my why I wanted to pursue a law degree. And ultimately it was because the work that I was doing was incredibly interesting, but it was very theoretical. And when I started speaking to folks in the field, I realized that the people who had tangible effects on policy and who could point to something and say, hey, this is what actually, what my work led me to do were attorneys. And that was one of the two women who, uh, one of the two attorneys worked on the Open Skies Treaty, the woman who crafted the legal uh, framework to get chemical weapons out of Syria, they were attorneys. And I think it Ultimately, it was that gap between the theoretical and the practical that wasn't being met by my desire to pursue a PhD. And so I decided that a legal career would marry that very uh, practical aspect that I was searching with, searching for with the more rigorous analysis that I was very still appreciative of. Um, I'm just curious, since you come from an immigrant family, and, and I do too, do they have strong opinions about what they wanted you to do? No. I know you mentioned that they thought you would make a good lawyer, but th- were they pressuring you into any field? No, my parents have always been, I'm very grateful to them for being so open about my future. They very much trusted me to make the decision that would be right for me. And they never really pushed me any which way. So I'm always incredibly grateful to them for letting me figure it out on my own. 
That's awesome. But it sounds like that's something that you've done throughout your whole path. You kind of just had to figure it out on your own and they continue to let you figure it out on your own because they, I'm sure they saw that you were able to do it, you know? Yeah. And I think it's also, they've always provided that support. I think more than anyone, they understand my perspective and where I'm coming from and why I work so hard. Whereas I think that's often lacking in some of my broader circles where maybe that kind of work ethic isn't as I wouldn't say not accepted, but I do think a lot of people wonder, why do you, why do you work so hard? And having that support within your own family has been so incredibly helpful and something that I am forever indebted to them for. You know, I even heard that perspective from one of my classmates, kind of what you wrote about in your caption of the picture where you talked about going to Columbia. Um, But one of my classmates, when we were studying for finals, she talked to me about it too. She's just like, I can't not work really hard. I can't not study really hard because I know all the sacrifices my family made for me to be here right now. And I just can't. It's like a, I, like I just, there's no option. <laughs> it's so true. It's something a lot of people feel, I think. So, okay, let's, so let's get a little bit more further along your path. So you decide you want to go to Columbia Law, but that's your dream school. I mean, you weren't, I don't, I don't, I think you were still open, open-minded about it, right? But it was just, that was your target school. One thing that we've talked about that I would love to share is that there were people along the way who didn't believe in you and you kind of, there's different ways of responding to that. And I want you to share a little bit about what they said, sorry, what they said and, and, and how you reacted to it. I think the clearest example I can think of is in eighth grade. I always share this. I just finished reading Dreams from My Father by Barack Obama. And it was right when the 08 presidential race was happening. I'd never heard of, I mean, you hear of politics, but you're like 12 or 13 years old. You don't really know what that means. And I'd never really seen anybody in a position of power and influence that I felt like I could relate to on any level. And so yeah. reading that book was incredibly transformational for me. And it led me to decide to pursue political science and international relations, which is exactly what I majored in. Um, but right around that time, I had a professor or a teacher that I really, who I really admired. And he was someone who was in charge of our leadership team in school. And I was a part of that team. But for whatever reason, one day after class, he decided to pull me aside and speak to me about my leadership capabilities. And he basically said, you know, I don't really see you as somebody who has the capacity to be a great leader. You're not going to be somebody who's able to move masses, I believe is the exact phrase that he used, which I think in the moment I was startled. And now as an adult, I think, well, that's a really big and sweeping statement to make about a middle school kid when you're not fully developed, your personality hasn't really fully formed. And and so looking back, there's that perspective. But in the moment, I remember being super disillusioned because I just decided that I wanted to pursue a degree in political science, whatever that meant. I wanted to do something public service related. I really wanted to get back to my community. And so much of that in my mind meant that I needed to have a voice. And here was somebody I respected saying, I don't really see you in that way. And so there are two ways you can take a statement like that. One is respond in anger, be defensive, think this person is just completely wrong. Um, And the other is to say, yes, maybe he shouldn't have said that, but what am I doing or how am I interacting with people that is giving off that impression? And for whatever reason, 13 year old me took the latter approach and I began examining, okay, what are some of the things that I can do differently or that I can improve on to become someone that people can see in the positions that I want to be in someday? And that to me was the beginning of a very long personal journey to really discovering what skills I had, what skills I could gain. And I think that was also the beginning of my growth mindset. Nice, which is so important. Okay, so I just want to clarify to those listening where we're going next with the conversation. We're going to be talking a little bit about how she approached LSAT and doing tutoring together, what her experience was like. And then also about the COVID application cycle. And then we're going to round it off with just some final thoughts about her future and some tips that she has, some practical tips that if you're thinking about going to law school or you're going to be a 1L2, um, maybe some things she's found useful on her path. So uh, Lisa, let's go talk about the LSAT now. I'm just curious if you could just tell us a little bit about your journey, like how it got started. You already mentioned that you bought the books um, when you were in Taiwan, but weren't using them. But what happens after that? So after that, once I completed my fellowship and decided this was something I wanted to do, I enrolled in an LSAT course. I was working full time while studying for the LSAT. So I think that is something that is completely doable if that's the situation that you're in. 
Um, but I took an LSAT course at night. I'd go from 6 to 10 p.m. right after work and I'd get up early and study. It was a lot of time management, um, but I also knew that the LSAT wasn't something that I felt I was just naturally good at. Some people are, some people are not. I don't think it says anything about your intelligence either way. I think that's something that a lot of people assume that if you're not good at the LSAT right off the bat, then you're not going to be a good lawyer. And I just don't think that's true at all. Yeah. And I, I actually think there's been some studies that show that there isn't really a correlation between how you do on the LSAT and how you perform in law school. So take that with a grain of salt as well. But it is an important component of your application. There's no denying that. And so it is something that I really do suggest that if you are serious about going to law school, you focus on the LSAT, try to do as well as you possibly can, because a lot of scholarship money flows from that. And a lot of other things um, can affect your well, a lot of things stem from the LSAT that can affect your legal trajectory in both positive and maybe not so positive ways. Okay, so you signed up for the course, you were studying full time, uh, or you're studying while working full time. So one question I get a lot, which I think will be helpful to hear from your perspective is how were you able to balance working full time and studying? A lot of good time management skills and discipline. <laughs> I, you I studied in the morning, getting... right? Sorry? Yeah. You were studying in the morning. Yes. So I had about an hour commute to work. So I would get up about 4.30 to 5, study for two hours before work, and then commute to work. I would actually study during lunch as well. There was a little hotel down the street from my firm, and I would go there and do blind review or practice problems during that hour. And then I would come home and do about an hour or two more. So that was my schedule more or less for a year. So how many hours is that total in, in, in the course of the day? Roughly. So I did about four hours, and then I would spend Saturday taking practice tests. I would take the rest of the day off, and then I would do blind review on Sunday. Although later on, I did change that schedule and started taking Sundays off, and that actually really helped me. And even though it sounds counterintuitive, I do think that taking time off is incredibly important when you're studying, and I think I burned myself out a little bit in the beginning. I mean, you know that I'm a huge believer in a yes. day off. For, yeah, okay. So... Some people are asking questions about how long did you study for? What was the name of the course? Do you want to share for either of those sure. things? I can share the name, both of those things. I took power score and I studied, I want to say, I studied for about nine months maybe, but I only think I studied for about four months effectively. Yeah. I was just not approaching the LSAT the way I should have. And I ended up wasting so much time. And I wish I just worked with Doreen earlier or knew about Doreen earlier because I would have saved five months of my life. So, okay. So how did you get to the point where, you, so you took the course. I feel I had a sense that you weren't so happy, but you took the course. And then how did you decide that you wanted to do tutoring? So the course, I will say, if you're somebody who needs structure and you benefit from structure, I really think PowerScore helped me start studying on a regular basis and develop a routine. However, I left the course, I continued studying and I stagnated and I just could not break um, the score that I wanted to go to the schools that I was trying to apply to. And I was so frustrated and I'd been following Doreen for a while and I just didn't understand how I could be studying this much and not see any improvements. And so I reached out to her, I think around maybe January or February of last year and started working together. And that was just so incredibly helpful because I finally felt like I had the tools that would allow me to break past that um, stagnation point and start seeing improvements. Because if you're working that hard and you're not seeing anything kind of like, you're not seeing a breakthrough, it can be really discouraging. What do you think it was that helped you go from be feeling stagnated to be able to improve? I think it's twofold. One was just meeting with somebody who didn't put didn't place a limit on how much I could improve. I think a lot of what I didn't like about the standard courses, and this isn't to call any course out in particular, but I think just across the board, there seems to be a very limited growth mindset when it comes to the LSAT. So I actually, one of the T14 schools, who I won't mention, they have on their website, this warning about retaking the LSAT where they don't really think that you can improve more than three points after you take it once, which I just do not believe. And that is not my experience at all. And so I will say that that I didn't appreciate that and working with somebody who was going to push me because they knew that I could do better and who had, I mean, Doreen, you've shared your story. Uh, yeah. And I think that just knowing that you went from a 148 to a 174 just gave me so much confidence because I 
I really wanted to work with somebody who was that ambitious and who didn't really see limits. And the second part was just the strategies that I received from you were just so helpful and really allowed me to change my entire strategy in a way that was effective. Because I really do think that I was doing a lot of busy work and not really identifying what the problems were and what the gaps were in my knowledge. And just changing that had a huge effect. There were some that you mentioned to me before we started, but I'm happy for you to share if you'd like to some of the some of the tools that you used uh, that were helpful to you. So the first one was just immersing myself in the LSAT. I think I was way too cautious before where I would do one practice exam on the weekends and then I would do practice problems during the week. I think it would take me an entire week to just review that exam that I'd taken the previous Saturday. And that's just not the way that I ended up approaching the LSAT when I started seeing results. And that when I actually started seeing the improvements was when I was doing whole practice sections and I was doing logic game sections all the time. I actually, I'm 99% sure I've done every single logic game section that's been released by LSAC. So just doing that, saw I saw my score just jump um, as soon as I got comfortable with the section, um, the logic game section in particular. I think also taking exams and reviewing them properly had a really big effect. So before I was doing blind review completely wrong and I hadn't realized it. And so once I started not only identifying the questions that I was unsure of, but then before I even checked my score, I would go back and redo those questions without the time constraint. And I wouldn't just circle the answer I thought was correct. I would write out why I thought it was correct. And then I would write out exactly why I thought all the other answers were incorrect. And this would end up being like a page of writing and really understanding that without the time constraint allowed me to be a lot faster in eliminating answers during time conditions. And I think that's something that's really important to do because the LSAT is rigorous, but it's not an intellectually, like you're not trying to parse something in an academic way like you would in a PhD program. You just don't have time for that. You have about a minute and 30 seconds per question or something like that, probably less if you really want time to review your answers at the end. And so you really want to hone that instinct and know which answer choices are wrong off the bat. There's a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to, I'm just going to go through them. One of them says, any tips for the first gen BIPOC applicants feeling demoralized about the process? I think you kind of hit on that in the beginning, but if you want to say anything to that. It is a long haul, but I think just keeping sight of your why is so important. And it's not only important for your mindset, but I think that will actually help you when you're writing out your application, because having a very clear sense of why you're even applying to law school will carry you a long way. Otherwise, it's just you taking practice exams, not really being thrilled with what you get on them and having to do it again. It's a really long process. I will also say that having a support system in place is the most important thing. If you are surrounding yourself with folks that are just not being supportive of everything that you're doing, or you have that kind of energy, I would really be mindful of that because it does have an effect, especially when you're committing so much of your life to this entire process. Um, It's just really important to have people in your life who are willing to provide that kind of moral support. And I would also add, you know, obviously there's pros and cons to any path. And first of all, we know that we can't change our paths. So just like accepting whatever your path is. But, you know, I also, I can relate to Lisa in that we we both come from first generation family backgrounds and things like that. And in a way, it makes it sweeter when you do achieve whatever it is that you achieve, because you know that you had to work that much harder to get there a lot of times. And that's not to say that somebody else who's successful in their path, like, like it was easy. It's, I don't think it's ever easy. I think people work really hard, but it, there's just pros and cons either way. And just knowing that whatever it is your path, you just need to make the most of it because there's going to be certain pros to your path that the other person might not have or whatever it is. I was just going to say, I also, one of the things that I think about a lot, especially when it comes to motivation or when I'm feeling demoralized is that motivation is a myth. And what I mean by that is I look at my parents going to work every day doing really hard work. I look at folks who get up and have to do backbreaking jobs and they don't have a choice because they either do it or they don't eat or they don't make rent. And I think about the privilege that I have in choosing this path. And so, yes, sometimes it's so demoralizing and there were so many low moments in my application journey, but just keeping in mind this 
end goal and also understanding that I am doing this not just for myself, but for my community writ large, I think less than 2% of all lawyers are Latina. And that to me is a huge motivator to just keep going because so many folks don't even have the option to start this journey. Yeah. Someone's curious what your diagnostic score is. I don't know if you want to share that. I think it was probably in the mid 150s, something like that. And then someone says, how long did it take for you to finally see progress? Probably a month. I honestly was just not applying the right strategies. Once I understood what I needed to do, the score increase came around pretty quickly. You know, one thing I wanted to ask you is you were already talking about it, but is there any way, so you would wake up at 4.30, you said, or 4.30 or 5. So can you kind of just say like the hours in terms of when you would start and end things? Just to hear like a day in the life kind of thing, because you, you you explained it, but I'm curious, like in terms of the actual time. So I, my goal was to start studying by 5.30 and okay. then I would study from about 5.30 to 7.30. I did eat breakfast. That was important to me. So 5 to 5.30, you're eating breakfast, just waking up. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then I would study for those two hours. I'd get ready in about 15 minutes. So 7.30 to 7.45, I'd be walking out of the house to go to work. I'd yeah. get to work a little before nine, get my second cup of coffee, work until 5.30, and then get home probably close to seven and study until maybe 8.39. And that was it every day that I was also studying after work. Sometimes it was less time. Sometimes it was not at all, but I really did try to finish out anything that I hadn't finished in the morning or during my lunch hour at work, which I should add that that was also a time that I used to study. Um, So, and then I'd go to bed probably around 10, 11. Okay. Well, so pretty, 10. 11 is late. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So pretty early. And then mm-hmm. what about your commute? Were you using your commute time or no? No, unfortunately I'm not somebody who can work on the metro. So I would use that time to listen to podcasts or just listen to any mindset type of work that I wanted to, to have in mind as I worked through the LSAT. So one thing I've seen with tutoring is that a lot of people underestimate the mindset that it takes to do well. And that also carries over to law school and beyond. So I'm curious if there's anything that you can share about mindset as it relates to the LSAT and just your legal journey so far. Mindset is everything. I (laughs) could have done your entire course, Doreen, and we could have worked together and I could have applied the strategies. But if you hadn't talked about mindset and we hadn't really worked through that together, I don't think I would have seen the same results. And I know that it's something that unless you do a lot of research into it or are really big on it, it doesn't really seem like something that has that big of an effect. But any high level performer from Kobe Bryant to Carly Lloyd, who are probably the two athletes that I admire most um, because of their commitment to mindset and hard work, they all understand the importance of framing things and putting yourself in the right headspace to perform at the level that you want to. Um, and I, I wouldn't understate that at all. One of my students that took the April exam, she was scoring in the 170s when she was practicing. And I asked her, I was like, it was right before she took the test or right after. I was like, is there anything you would have done differently? And she's like, I would have started working on mindset earlier. And it was funny because when I was talking to her about mindset, when we were working together, I could tell that she wasn't really into it. But it's just really hard to do well if you're not if, if you're not thinking about it a certain way, or if you're not approaching it, I think at the end of the, the day, it just comes back to the growth mindset that you talked about. I've never said anything bad about the LSAT. That was something that I went in knowing that I was never going to complain about it. And I was never going to say, I hate the LSAT or anything like that. To me, it was like, I get to take the LSAT, not I have to take the LSAT. Even things like that, that are so small in terms of framing were so important, especially doing the entire process during COVID. I yeah. think if I hadn't focused on mindset, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have completed the application cycle. So I was going to ask you about studying during COVID, but it, it feels like things are starting to open up again. So are there any lessons that you took away from studying during COVID that you think people can apply even moving forward now when like it's, there's less, quarantine is less of a, is a less of a thing now? Going into studying, I really thought that I needed the right environment and I needed to have things really well set up in order for me to do well on my practice tests and things like that. But when COVID hit, I just didn't have that anymore. I, we were all at home. There was a lot of noise. There was just un, 
not the best circumstances just in yeah. terms of having a quiet space. And so I think just approaching the LSAT with the understanding that you can actually be successful in a lot of different environments as long as you kind of yeah. focus and decide that you're going to be successful. Um, that's really helpful, especially even if you're taking it in person, there's always going to be something that happens. A proctor is whispering or talking or somebody is coughing or sniffling or whatever it might be. I think if you focus too much on those little distractions, it can be really easy to get sidetracked. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, let's talk about Columbia. Can you tell us a little bit about the whole process of applying during COVID? And also, I'd love to hear why Columbia. We haven't really talked about that at all. Yeah. So I will say that in terms of applying on the whole, I think it's more of an organizational problem than a substantive one. And I will die on that hill because I often hear applying to law school is so hard and it's going to take forever. And and I think the reason that it's difficult is because we often don't plan for the long term. And so I started planning for the actual components of my application probably January of the cycle that I was going to be applying for. So January of last year, but I asked for letters of recommendation really early on. I had those in by June, I believe I started working on my personal statement in January as I was studying for the LSAT. So I was putting all these little pieces in place. And so I think if anybody's worried about the time crunch or just having to apply to so many schools and all of that, honestly, reverse engineering it and figuring out yeah. when different schools deadlines are, make your spreadsheet, decide what schools you're going to apply to. All of that is incredibly, incredibly helpful. Um, and then as to your question, why Columbia? To be honest, Columbia was my dream school that I didn't really talk about because I didn't want to get my hopes up. So I think when we spoke, I had other schools in mind. Um, but this was the one that I had been thinking about for a very long time. Part of it was because a lot of, a couple of people that I really admired from my undergrad had gone there. Um, Columbia is also a very big uh funnel into big law, which is the kind of law that I want to practice at this point. I don't know. I'm pretty open to other experiences as well. And being in New York was a big draw for me. I am a very big proponent of environment being a very, uh, environment can have a very big effect on your overall experience anywhere. And I'd gone to undergrad in a small suburb. There wasn't a whole lot to do. And I knew that I wanted to go to law school somewhere that was a little bit more vibrant and had more culture and things like that. So it was a combination of different factors, but environment, the kind of law I want to practice, and also the fact that it's Colombian people that I really admired had gone there before was a pretty big draw. You mean me, right? No, I'm just <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, who were some of the people? I'm curious. Who were some of the people who went to Columbia Law that you that that were a part of the motivation or drive for wanting to go? Well. RBG, let's start with yes. that one. Um, Tony Blinken, our current Secretary of State, who was President Obama's National Security Advisor, so Columbia Law alum as well. Um, a couple of students from Wellesley had gone there, and so I had first heard about the school through through their lens, and I was really motivated by that. So there was just a lot of different reasons why I wanted to go there, and I'm really excited to to get started in the fall. I'm really excited for you, honestly. We talked about it, but I'm really excited for you. Someone someone asked, how long did you seek tutoring for? How long did we work together? I think two, three months, maybe two months. Something uh, like that. And it was was it continuous? I feel like it wasn't continuous, was it? No. I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. The thing with tutoring with me is that like I always tell my students that I'm happy to be available outside. Like if you have questions or like you want to talk on the phone or text me or whatever. So for me, I don't think of it in terms of like timeline. It's just if you want, if you need hours, we do hours together. If you don't need hours, then I would never pressure you. So while we're talking about tutoring, what would your testimonial be if you had if I had to put you on the spot? It's, okay, let me see. I'm on the spot now. I <laughs> honestly really appreciated that you were willing to push me in ways that I don't feel like my other instructors were. And I think part of that is because working one-on-one -on -one with someone, you have a better sense of their trajectory and what they want to accomplish. But I also really appreciated that whenever I would, you know, say something that wasn't necessarily lining up with the kind of mindset I was trying to cultivate or doing something that wasn't quite fitting in with the strategy we devised, you were really willing to call me out on that in a kind but firm way. And I really thrive off that kind of feedback. And for me, it was just an indication that you were invested in my success as a person, which I really didn't feel with other programs that I tried. 
or with yeah. the other I mean, program that I tried, I should say. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm in this space because I because I love it. I, I think it's a lot of fun to see people like be able to achieve what they want to do and sometimes exceed what they want to do. Um, so someone asked, "Do you have any suggestions?" And thank you, by the way. I know I put you on the spot. <laughs> of course. <laughs> do you have any suggestions as to what or where to study? I think they meant to say. Libraries are still closed in my county. Coffee shops are sometimes hard to focus in and they close early. I would actually say coffee shops because they're hard to focus in. This is something that really worked for me because I don't do well with a ton of distractions. And I really wanted to hone uh, that skill set because I really do think it is a skill to be able to be in an environment that is not conducive to you, you focusing and you being able to still do something as difficult as the LSAT because you really can't control what happens on test day, especially now that everything's in person. But even when you're taking the LSAT flex, right, and you're at home, a lot can go wrong. Family members can walk in, your neighbors can be loud, whatever might happen, you need to be prepared for it. And working in a coffee shop is really helpful. That being said, I also did work at a lot of libraries. um, And then in my room, honestly, that's where I had to figure out how to make it work, because I don't do work in my room. That's one of my rules. I like to keep my work and personal life completely separate. I never studied in my dorm, always at the library. So I think just being flexible, but also knowing what you learn best in. So if you're trying to learn any concept, then yes, find somewhere quiet. But if you're taking an exam and you're trying to figure out how to best sustain a level of focus in difficult circumstances, then do the coffee shop. Yeah, I, I, I'm a believer in that as well. It doesn't have to be about the LSAT, but what do you wish you knew before you took the LSAT? Whether it's about the legal career path, the LSAT, law school. I wish I'd known that not being good on the LSAT straight out of the gate has absolutely no bearing on where you can end up. And I think I knew that, but I didn't really internalize that until way later. It's just, it's a learnable test. I think people don't realize it's a learnable test. It's, and I think that's true for most standardized tests. You just, It depends on how much time and effort you can and are willing to put into it, but it's a learnable test. If you put in the time, I think it's, you can see results. Absolutely. We have like about 15 minutes left. So I kind of want to open it up to questions because that's kind of the point is to make sure that any questions that you guys have are answered. Is there anything else, Lisa, that we talked about that you think we should, we should talk about now? I think we've covered a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have about career path, having legal internships before going to law school. I didn't really do anything at pre-law related. So if people have questions about that and how that looks on an application, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. How did you approach um, not having so much um, pre-law, pre-law activities on your application? I think I ended up seeming like I had a lot more pre-law activity because I did work at a law firm I right think when I was applying to, to law school. But I really think... Of, trying to focus on the skills that you have that are relevant for law school can be really helpful as you craft your application. So for example, I didn't really work at you know, a law firm for you know a long time um, by the time I, ha- I was applying, but I did have a lot of writing skills and speaking skills and leadership skills that I thought would uh, really stand out on an application. And I made sure that those were the central focus. So my sister actually asked, I wasn't here before, but what things did you do in undergrad that you think helped your application? I don't know if it was so much undergrad as what I did afterwards. I published an academic book chapter, which I think looks really good on an application because it shows that you can write, you can write something that has undergone peer review, and you've also seen a long-term project through to the finish line. Yes. I also wrote an undergraduate thesis, which was a pretty long piece of work. So that also, I think, helps um, that they knew that I had these research uh, skills. I also did a really brief internship at an asylum law firm. And because the firm was so small, I was able to write affidavits basically unsupervised that then the attorney would look over and submit to the judge. And he was able to speak to that on my application and just say that I'd actually done legal work that had required wow. minimal um, editing from my supervising attorney. And I think that also shows that I was able to actually put or produce work in a legal setting before I'd even gotten to law school. And I think that was really helpful. 
That's awesome. And also, I think having the Fulbright on your application, I know that wasn't during undergrad, but I think having a Fulbright on your application makes a huge difference. And we've talked about this, but Professor Carter also did a similar, she did a Fulbright. Did she also do it in Taiwan? She did. That's crazy. I know. (laughs) Do you want to say very briefly what Fulbright is for people who don't know? I think most people do, but yeah. So Fulbright grant is given by the U.S. State Department, and there are different types of grants. So there are teaching grants and there are research grants. But basically, if you're awarded one of these, you go abroad to whatever country you applied for. You can only apply to one country. So once you submit your application, you will have said that you will go to that country if you're selected. And I did a teaching one in Taiwan, which meant meant that I was teaching, I believe, 500 students in elementary school. So I would teach about 20 classes a week. And I did that for about a year, which was an incredible experience. And I learned so much just jumping into the teaching profession without any background. I just have so much respect for teachers. But after that experience, that just grew exponentially because I actually got to see everything that teachers do. And just it changed my perspective on a lot of things. You know, we had a, I had a few classmates who also did Teach for America. I feel like having some background with teaching is not uncommon for a lot of students. At least not at Columbia, at least not from what I saw. There are a lot of really great questions. Someone asked, how did you approach professors, et cetera, when requesting your LOR? So I had two really great professors in undergrad who were on my thesis defense committee, and they were the professors that I asked for letters of recommendation. I kept in touch with them after I graduated because I knew that I was going to be taking several years off, and I knew that I would eventually need graduate letter letters of recommendation, um, whether or not I did decide to go to law school. So I would update them periodically. If I did something interesting, I would send them a link or I would just check in with them around the holidays or New Year's, things like that. Um, And I think that really helped keep me on their radar. I think being proactive about that is really important, especially if you're still an undergrad. Professors really are there to help you grow as an academic and as a student. And so don't be shy about going to office hours. It is our job to help you. And I think we're often a little bit too reticent to ask for that help. And I'm sure in law school, it, it'll be the same kind of situation where approaching professors in office hours is really helpful, not only for your development as a student, but also because you're going to need professors to write you letters in the future, especially if you're applying, I suppose, in law school for things like clerkships. Yeah, I, I never applied for clerkships, but I'm pretty sure that that is really important. And I remember my classmates talking about the process of getting letters of rec. It wasn't always very fun because as a 1L, you're you're mainly in classes with, at least at Columbia, it's like 100 people, you know, so mm-hmm. it's kind of hard. And yeah, 1L professors are just so busy, like a lot of times they don't get to know you so well. But we also had smaller classes, like legal writing was like 10 people. My con law class was about like 15 people for some reason. I don't know why con law specifically. But yeah, I mean, I, I remember my classmates going through that process and not necessarily loving it. <laughs> as a 1L, it's hard. I think it gets a little easier as you go on. Antonio asked, what areas of big law interests you? Out of At the moment, I will say it's antitrust. I'm actually doing a summer internship at a big law firm this summer. And so I'm sure I'll have a better sense of whether or not that is a good fit for me, depending on what practice group I get assigned to as well. So we'll see. But at the moment, antitrust. So there's still a few questions. So I'm going to, if we can make it more lightning round, I want to try to get through it as much as possible before. Yes, let's do it. Okay. So how many years out of undergrad were you when you applied? How did you stay connected? I think you talked about how you stay connected with professors, but go ahead. So I graduated 2017. So about four years. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and then I think just honestly, approaching professors as people is really yeah. helpful. And just that's a key way to stay in touch. And then two questions we have here. What are some unexpected issues students face in law school? I mean, you haven't started yet, but if you have anything you want to share. I have no idea, but I'm sure I will love finding out. Love finding out, yes. Does age matter when applying to law school? No. I actually think that for some things, it might be helpful to be a few years out. You have a different set of experiences going into it. And I also know from the experience of having taken a PhD course when I was nowhere near prepared for it, that having that intellectual maturity in a classroom is incredibly valuable. Okay. And then the question I really wanted to ask you, or did I miss anything? 
Oh, okay. And I agree with you because I think a lot of my classmates at Columbia were a few years out. And I think that unless you had, and even sometimes if, but unless you had really, really strong numbers like GPA LSAT, most people had some outside experience. And even then, like a lot of them had strong numbers, but also had work experience that really added a lot to the classroom. Like I really appreciated it and I saw, and it wasn't all legal related. So I think that was really cool. Like we had people who had been monks. Um, we had people who had worked in human trafficking. It was just like a wide range of different experiences. And in the classroom, when professors would ask questions, a lot of times you would see that, that some, like they would ask some obscure thing, like, has anyone done this? And there would always be at least one person who raised their hand in a class of, it was a big class. It was a class of 100, but still. I, I think it was like 90. Say, I yeah. wanted to mention this earlier, but I think when you're crafting your application, a lot of people place emphasis on the fact that law schools are looking for well-rounded people. And I think yeah. that's right, but I view it as they're looking for a well-rounded class. Yes. If you're a well-rounded person, but you're well-rounded yes. in the same way as everybody else, you're not really going to stand out. Yes. So when you're crafting your application, for example, for me, I'm first gen, I'm a woman and I'm Latina. So how do I craft my application in a way that makes me stand out in all three of those buckets? And that I think was incredibly useful. Okay. So I was going to ask you, and since you started on that, I'm just curious how you approached your personal statement, how, how you thought about what to write about and, and the strategies and things like that. I really wanted something that was unique and I selected something that I thought was very, very new to the committee or would be new to the committee coming from somebody who came from my background. And so I focused on living in Taiwan and nuclear security. And I basically talked about how being in Taiwan, I heard more about nuclear weapons than I ever had living in a nuclear armed state. And I talked about how that led me to work on nuclear security issues and how I learned more about the defense budget and how a lot of folks who make policy aren't really the folks who are in communities that are impacted by policy. And I wanted at that point, because I was working on emerging technology and nuclear security, I really started learning about the nexus between technology and the law. And I became really aware of just how little input there are from marginalized community, communities of colors, of communities of color in these spaces. Um, basically, in any national security panel, these were the voices that were con consistently absent. And I thought, okay, well, how do I make an impact here? And the folks who were making tangible impacts, who could point to policy or could point to an agreement and say, I did that, that's what my work produced, were attorneys. And that was ultimately my why. That's amazing. And I could see how that's super powerful because I think if you're able to write something in your personal statement that is very unique to you, which is kind of, it sounds like that was your strategy and goal even going in. Um, first of all, you'll be memorable, hopefully, you know, obviously in a good way. And also, yeah, you show that you have a certain area of expertise that you can add to the classroom. And, and, and I think it's very true what you said. It's not about being necessarily just a well-rounded person. It's about a well-rounded class. And so they're looking at each person to contribute something to the classroom and their own perspective, whatever it might be. So I wanted to ask you if there are any resources or any like practical tips that you would give to, to anyone who's along working along their path in pre-law, or I guess for you, it would make more sense to give pre-law advice since you're also pre-law technically. So yeah, are, are there any resources that you use, practical tips or anything that you'd recommend? I would say talk to attorneys. And yeah. don't just talk to one attorney who works in an area that you're interested in, but talk to yeah. attorneys in big law, talk to attorneys who work on immigration law, public interest law, because you're going to get pieces of information from each of these people that might have no overlap with something that someone else said. And so that allows you to form a more holistic picture of the profession, which I found incredibly helpful. Like I had no idea whether I wanted to do public interest law or big law, but having those experiences both in more public interest centered law and intellectual property law and then the summer big law really allowed me to decide with confidence which kind of law that I wanted to go into that might change like I said I'm open to it but at this point that's what that research led me to so I will say like reach out to people over LinkedIn craft a nice message people are more willing to talk to you than we often think mm -hmm. um, so that would be my biggest piece of advice but also read go on above the law and read articles about the legal profession, see what people are saying, what the salient issues are, because you'll learn more about the law in that way than you will by just focusing on what one person that you know says. 
Yeah. And, and, and like you said, I think I would reiterate, like, don't hold one to one opinion too strongly. Don't weigh it too heavily just because someone's ex- experience is one way doesn't mean that's right. Like you could live in LA and have a, like everybody in the city has a different opinion about it. Right. So it really just depends on how the two mesh. And take everyone's opinion with a grain of salt. Like even anything that I'm saying, if it doesn't work for you, don't use it. This is just my process, but it's not something that's going to necessarily work for everyone. And I think knowing yourself is so important and just kind of taking the pieces of advice of advice that are relevant to you and dropping the rest. That's a very fair approach to take. How would you have approached the LSAT differently knowing what you know now, now, if you would have approached it differently? I probably would not have taken the first course. I think I'm someone who has enough discipline to have set that study schedule for myself, but I definitely thought that I needed the course in order to do well. Um, yeah. And I would have worked smarter, not harder. Yeah. And how would you have approached the application cycle differently knowing what you know now? That I wouldn't really change. I actually feel nice. like I approached that in a way that was very authentic to me and that was very low stress just because I organized it in a way that allowed me to feel like I spent enough time on everything without feeling overwhelmed around the time that I was submitting applications. That's really good. And I mean, obviously, first of all, it worked. And second of all, just from what you said, I think the themes that you focused on were authentic and like you were just strategic about it. And I think you do have to be in how you approach it. Okay. Any, any final thoughts, like anything that you want to share? I think, you know, even just thinking about what's unique about you and your path, if you, if there are other people who are in a somewhat similar position, what would you say to them? Even if it was thinking about your former self, like getting started on this path, well, what would you say to someone who's a little bit earlier on in their journey? Be open to trying new things. Even if it has nothing to do with anything that you're interested in, one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to find that you actually really enjoy it and it's going to shift your path in some way, or you're going to learn that it's not for you. And I think knowing what you don't like is as important as as knowing what you do like. And it's something that we often underestimate because we say, why are you doing engineering if you're going to be a lawyer? But I actually took an engineering course as an undergrad that started steering me toward my interest in technology, which is exactly what I want to focus on during my career. So I wouldn't underestimate what little serendipitous brushes with subject areas that you might not be aware of at the moment might do for your future. Are there any books that you recommend? Because I know you love reading. We both love reading. Oh, I have so many books and I'm not going to be able to think of any on the spot. I think David Goggins Can't Hurt Me is the first one that comes to mind because I was reading it earlier. Yeah. Um, I read 1L, which I know a lot of people recommend you don't read if you're planning on going to law school, but I read it a few years ago and it's, it was written in the 70s. So I think it doesn't necessarily speak to today's law school experience, but it is a classic of the legal profession. So reading that um, was really helpful for me. It didn't deter me from applying. So that was good. I, I figured if I want to do it, I might as well read this book that's supposed to convince me to not do it. Um, and I, I can't think of any others off the top of my head. I but... think one thing I just wanted to ask you about is just because I talked to Pete Davis yesterday from Rope Committed. And I asked him, and I'm curious to hear from you too, what is your view on on the concept of range? It's kind of what you've been talking about, um, the, the book range, if you want to explain it, because I never ended up reading it, but you brought it up. And I think it's a really interesting concept. Actually, that's another book I would definitely recommend anybody read. But the idea of range is basically that people who are coming at a problem from a completely different field or perspective often have more creative solutions to that problem and end up being more successful in solving it than folks who are so steeped in it that they maybe can't see it as holistically. And that's something that I firmly believe in. I've really explored a lot of different areas thus far in my short professional life. Um, But I found it incredibly useful because it's allowed me to see how different folks operate based on their professional biases, the kind of um, slant that a particular field has. And knowing how different people view different things makes me a much better thinker because I've had exposure to that. And it also makes me better able to withstand ambiguity because I understand that there's no hard yes 
in life necessarily, because who you are is going to determine a lot of how you view the world. And so I could see something and say, hey, this is white. And you could look at it and say, absolutely not. That is pink. And that's just something that I have found incredibly helpful. And I know that Pete talks a lot about this counterculture of commitment, which I actually don't think is mutually exclusive or it doesn't, I don't think it's something that it, that doesn't they don't, really they don't butt heads but, necessarily yes, they can coexist exactly. peacefully exactly peacefully <laughs> um, because I do think that you can devote a lot of your time to honing in on a craft and still explore multiple crafts throughout your life in a I, meaningful way yeah. and that's something that I hope to have the opportunity to do yeah that's beautiful I, I appreciate you so much for taking the time to share your experience and I'm so excited for us to continue to stay in touch and I mean, it's just been awesome, like getting to know you post tutoring, because I feel like I've learned so much about you. And I'm excited for you to start your journey at Columbia Law School and to see where it takes you and where you take it. <laughs> Thanks so um, much, Doreen. I yeah, honestly enjoyed working with you so much. And I'm so <laughs> grateful for your mentorship and now your friendship. And I'm just so excited to see what you do with before you take the LSAT. And I so appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone who joined us and asked questions and were engaged. Um, I hope that you found this helpful and I will save the live. Bye, everyone. Have a great night.